Can neutron stars create the equivalent of a type 1a supernova? Can you land on Venus without a parachute? How do we know the shape of the Oort cloud? And in Q&A Plus, what's going on with 3i Atlas's weird tail situation? All in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, the question pops in your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them up, and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Ian Kamor, white dwarfs can steal mass from their companions, eventually reaching the Chandrasekhar limit and going type 1a supernova, but do neutron stars have an equivalent? So theoretically, yes, you know, we know that that a white dwarf in a binary system with some kind of donor star is siphoning material off of that star and adding it to layers on the surface of the white dwarf. And sort of like the story of this is a little more complicated than we used to think. Like originally, it was just that some stars would be adding this material, they would go nova off their surface when they had accumulated too much material, and then they would keep going. And eventually, they would gather enough material that they would explode as a type 1a supernova. But it now really appears that novae and supernovae from this process are two different things that if you have a slow enough feeding rate, then this material gets absorbed on the outside of the white dwarf, it flashes off the surface, and then the process begins anew. And we see this brightening every, you know, number of decades. Uh, but it seems to go on forever. But in other cases, maybe when the rate of material that is being transferred from the donor star to the white dwarf is is too fast that it starts to build up. And eventually, as you say, you hit that that 1.4 Chandrasekhar limit and you get a explosion, uh, which is 1.44 times the mass of the sun. And neutron stars appear to have a version of that as well, which is like about two a little over two times the mass of the sun. And so you could have a neutron star that is very close to a companion star. And one of the definitions of this, they call them black widow pulsars, I think, is one example. So you have a neutron star, a pulsar is a type of neutron star that is very close to another star, it is pulling material off of that star. And the question is, you know, is some class of supernovae that we see out there due to neutron stars feeding on material from a companion star, or a type of gamma ray burst caused by neutron stars feeding on material from a companion star, because, you know, once you hit a certain amount of mass on the neutron star, it can no longer remain as a neutron star and will have to collapse to the next level. And there's an, some interesting ideas for what are some intermediate types of objects that you could get. One possibility is that you get a uh, quark star. So like, in the case of a, a neutron star, the thing is made of neutrons that all of the electrons and all of the protons have been pushed together into neutrons. But we know that neutrons and other baryonic atoms are made of quarks. And so it might be that if you push the pressure on the neutron star even further, then you're going to get a uh, a star that is made of quarks. And maybe you get this flash of energy as this process happens as the thing goes one level down, and now becomes like just barely bigger than a black hole. And then as it continues to consume more material, then it actually does make that final step and become a black hole. So this is all right at the cutting edge. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting observations, there's a lot of great telescopes that are trying to get to the bottom of this. And I think, you know, back to the telescope that I'm most excited about Vera Rubin, these are the kinds of things that Vera Rubin is going to be looking for, right, you're going to be scanning the entire sky, you're going to be looking for all of the stars that went supernova. Right now, astronomers know of about 2000 type 1a supernovae, which are where those white dwarfs turn into supernova. Vera Rubin should find a million of them in 10 years, right? Like, so many more. And then you're going to find all of the edge cases. So you're going to see all those type 1a supernova, but then you're going to see this smaller fraction, you're going to see 1000s, 10s of 1000s of weird supernova that that maybe we've only seen one example of them in the past. And now we're going to see 1000s, 10s of 1000s. And that will allow astronomers to really finely slice down all the different kinds of events that appear to happen in the universe very rapidly. And we may finally have this really complicated flow chart that explains how you go from big star to supernova from small star to white dwarf to supernova from big star to neutron star to 
Quark Star to Supernova to Black Hole and all that. And so stay tuned. I think this is this is going to be a really interesting time in in our understanding of, you know, the how stars evolve over time and die. And it's all going to be thanks to Vera Rubin. So stay tuned. Hannes Kitz. Venus has such a dense atmosphere. Would it be possible to land a lander without parachutes? It should kind of float down. Yes, that's kind of what happens. So landing something on Venus is actually very simple to do because the density of the atmosphere is, is very high. So when you're first interacting with Venus, so if you send some kind of lander to Venus, you do need an aeroshell in the beginning to be able to decelerate it into the atmosphere of Venus. You've just got this really complicated, easy to destroy lander leg sticking out as it's coming in in the atmosphere at more than 10 kilometers per second, you're going to start to burn off all of that stuff in the same way that you need to have like a nice heat shield as you enter the Earth's atmosphere. It's a very similar experience getting into Venus as it is to uh, trying to re enter the Earth's atmosphere. Then as you start to pass down through the atmosphere, um, the atmosphere thickens up heavily. So so you would still have the aeroshell, then you deploy your parachutes. And now your your spacecraft has dropped to terminal velocity, right? You're dropping down with the parachute and parachutes work really well on Venus. You don't need very big parachutes. And they provide a lot of of slowing down your spacecraft. And then at a certain point, you just let go. <laughs> and your lander can now just descend and drop as if it is falling down into water. And once you reach the surface of Venus, the density of the atmosphere is the same density as water one kilometer below the surface on Earth. And so it would very much be the same thing as if you were just like dropping a rock dropping a piece of metal into the atmosphere, and it will slowly descend down and touch down at the bottom of Venus with not a lot of velocity, getting yourself slowed down and getting into the atmosphere is the hard part. But once you're there, it's actually a very easy time. And the Soviets with their Venera program back in the 1970s and 80s, they sent mission after mission mission after mission to Venus. And they learned how awful the conditions of Venus are, because their spacecraft kept dying, that they would reach a certain point a certain depth in the atmosphere, and then the spacecraft would go offline. And they're like, well, I thought we built it tough enough, we had lots of shielding, and we made it very heat tolerant, and we made it very tough and was in a pressure vessel. Nope, Venus killed it. Okay, let's make it tougher. And then they sent another one and then they got further down and they're like, then it died. Nope. Okay. And so finally, you know, it took several attempts and they were finally able to actually drop spacecraft down onto the surface of Venus that were able to survive in the beginning for almost no time. And then after a while, they were able to survive, I think to about, you know, just around 45 minutes was the longest they were able to keep something alive down on the surface of Venus before they started to give up. You know, they had done what they wanted, they took pictures of the surface of Venus. And uh, it's a very different experience than what you would have. But it's kind of similar to like, say, when people send probes to explore the interior of uh, Saturn and Jupiter, when the um, Galileo spacecraft went to Jupiter, it brought along a probe that was released into the atmosphere of Jupiter, same thing, aeroshell, to slow it down, parachute to then slow it down to terminal velocity. And then it just fell down into the atmosphere made it made it a couple hundred kilometers and then was crushed by the high pressure and the increasing temperature as it fell into Jupiter. So uh, dropping into gas giants dropping into Venus, it's a very similar experience. Of course, a different landing entry descent landing and destruction profile. It's time to shout out all the new $5 patrons and above Vincent Warner, Hiram, Devlook, James Sharpnack, Mark Lapierre, Jay Hammer, Dean, Brennan O'Donnell, George L. Preput, and Scott Olson. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Thomas Starkey is the Oort cloud a properly coined term people imagine it's a sphere encasing the solar system would calling it the outer extent of the sun's gravitational influence be more accurate? Well, I mean, I think the term the Oort cloud comes from was it Jan Oort, who looked at the trajectories of all of the comets that were coming down into the solar system, and said, Well, they have to be coming from somewhere. 
And if you calculate the orbit of a comet on this long elliptical journey that they're making, then you can map out where this object began its descent down into the inner solar system. And it turns out that it has been falling for hundreds of 1000s, if not millions of years, and has been traveling, if you just like, like, trace out the ellipse that this comet is following, then you will go all the way out to this place that is going to be 10s of 1000s of astronomical units, hundreds of 1000s of astronomical units potentially away from the sun, it can be one light year it can be maybe even two light years away from the sun. And that that is the that is where the comets come from. And they're coming from random directions around the the sun, there's not some specific belt that lines up with say the plane of the ecliptic where all of the comets are coming from they're coming from random directions. And so if you were to just like take each one and, and map out in three dimensions, the origin, the starting point of each one of those comets, if you did that 10,000 times 100,000 times, eventually, you would have drawn out a sphere of dots surrounding the sun. That is the Oort cloud. Now your question like is it the outer extent of the sun's gravitational influence? The sun's gravitational influence moves at the speed of light. And so really, the sun's gravitational influence extends out to 13.8 billion light years away from the sun. If you are if you can see the sun, then you are experiencing a teeny tiny little bit of its gravity. So where does the outer extent of the sun's gravitational field end? It doesn't end until you know, unless you could move faster than the speed of light. And so like a lot of times people will sort of fall into this uh, definitional set series of arguments where they'll say, you know, we I heard that the Voyagers have left the solar system, but they're still moving through the Kuiper belt, or they're still moving through the Oort cloud. Did, did they really leave the solar system? And the answer is it depends on what your definition is of the solar system, the influence of the solar system, right? That, that, that there are a bunch of boundaries that you're going to reach, there's going to be the place where you pass the last planet is that the end of the solar system? There's gonna be this place where you exit out of the Kuiper belt. Is that the end of the solar system? There's gonna be this place where you pierce through the boundary where the sun's solar wind is sort of filling up this volume of the Milky Way, and is overwhelmed by the collective solar winds from all the other stars that are out there. And you get this bubble, the heliosphere, helioshock, heliosheath, heliopause, that are you know different layers that are around the sun. Is that the boundary of the solar system? You know, when you say that voyagers have left the solar system, well, people go like, wait a minute, is it still being affected by the sun's gravity? Yes, of course it is. And it will be for 14 plus billion years. Right. But this is the place and it's not a gravitational thing. It's a pressure thing where the sun is putting out enough particles of solar wind that eventually they sort of stop being the main influence in the area. And now you're just getting the interstellar wind from all of the stars. Well, the sun is holding on to these Oort cloud objects all the way out to two light years ish away. And that's like just barely overlaps what's happening with Alpha Centauri and just barely overlaps with other stars out there. And that kind of makes sense. Right? You know, we know that there is a hill sphere around any object, this is the place where if you have a thing that's in orbit around it, it will stay in orbit around that thing. But if you get outside of the hill sphere, then it will be easy to steal. And so objects that are out in the Oort cloud as they go through gravitational or as they go through gravitational three body interactions with each other, some are kicked down and and perform this death dive down into the inner solar system and others are kicked out. And they fall off the hill sphere of the sun, and they become interstellar objects. And so as we discover these interstellar objects, we are finding objects that were no longer able to be held by their star through whatever reason they were given a slight kick, just a nudge is all it takes when you're out at the very edge, the very limits of what the sun can hold. So uh, there's a million definitions for where the solar system ends and like just you just want to be specific about which one it is. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A plus and this week's bonus question, what's happening with three eye Atlas's tail, and I'll put a link in the show notes.
All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everybody who uh, put your questions into the YouTube comments, everybody who joined me for the live show, which we recorded. Uh, that was the European live show, which we do at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time, but it's evening for Europe. Uh, then I just recorded the Pacific one. So the next one's going to be the Australia time show. So if you're watching it this week, uh, stay tuned. It's going to be late Sunday night, which will turn into Monday for people in uh, in Asia. Now I'm going to chat about the media that I am consuming right now. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bear Lake Roofing, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Cy Nielsen, Dave Verbeoff, David Gilton, David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Monzo, Porobak, Brent Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Feller Munley, Team 49, Vlad Chiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So we just wrapped up a bunch of pretty great television. Uh, the on Apple TV, we just saw the end of season three of Foundation, uh, which is the equivalent of second Foundation book. But if you've read the Foundation books and you're watching the Foundation TV show, they are two separate things. You know, enjoy them separately. <laughs> I'm still playing Path of Exile 2 as my video game right now, and I'm really enjoying it. I mean, they really have nailed uh, this season of Path of Exile 2. The first one was fun because it was different. You know, I played a lot of Path of Exile 1, but you know, now we're playing Path of Exile 2. I didn't bother playing the second season, but this season is terrific, especially because they've added a way for people to buy and sell items to each other. And that is just the greatest thing ever. So if you are like on the fence, Path of Exile 2 has been going really, really well. Uh, reading wise, I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I am rereading some classics that I read as a kid. And this really influential book series by Rogers Lasney uh, called Nine Princes in Amber. So I finished Nine Princes in Amber, totally holds up. I was gripped reading Nine Princes in Amber again. Now I'm reading The Guns of Avalon, which is the second book, totally gripped. Such a good book, such a good series. Young me had good taste in sci-fi fantasy, and I'm really enjoying uh, reading the whole series again and sort of stewing on the nostalgia of, you know, these these moments. Like I should just go and watch, like watch Aliens, read Nine Princes in Amber, watch Star Trek The Next Generation, Ren and Stimpy, just you know, really get in touch with my nostalgic side and reappreciate all of the things that I enjoyed younger and many of them still stand up. So uh, let me know, let me know what nostalgic things you are uh, in the process of, of going through right now. Uh, stuff that I'm looking forward to right now, the new season of Alice in Borderlands just came out. And by the time you're watching this, I will probably have already watched it, but I really enjoyed the first two seasons of it. And I'm looking forward to the third season. All right. Uh, so yeah, let me know what you're watching. Let me know what you're reading. Let me know what you're playing. Uh, we will see all of you next time.